All right, welcome back to the book of Exodus. Here we are studying Moses and the Israelites, and then how do they interact with each other when they're wandering around aimlessly, it feels like at times, in the wilderness. They're just trying to survive food and water. And then how do you you get along with each other? Well, I love this because at Mount Sinai, God gives Moses not only just the Ten Commandments, but then he also says, oh, by the way, here's some more ordinances. And so in this process of engaging the people, he said, here's some specific cases on how I want you to treat people. And so, you know, we know in Exodus 19, the Mosaic Covenant came in, the Ten Commandments came in, the ordinances, the uh, judgments came in. And then yesterday we even talked about, just to give you an idea of some of these ordinances, Stealing animals, the crops, what do you do when your, your cattle comes over and, and eats some of your, your wheat? What do you do about that? And then your neighbor's wheat. And then what about other people's belongings? And then you have, you know, men and women and their relations. And then you have capital offenses and one kills this person and this person kills. And then how do you take care of the widows and the fatherless? And then what about the foreigners? And then in all of this, you want to be holy and not eat mauled animals on the side of the road. Like, it's been quite interesting. And I promise you, it doesn't slow down. <laughs> so in Exodus 23, now I will tell you this, before you're like, check out already, you're like, oh, I gotta go through another judgment time, another ordinance time. I just wanna encourage you, this is a really, this to me, there's some real good meat here um, that I believe really begins to paint a picture about how the Israelites are living today. And they're serving as markers about what God has already been doing in the past. So now to get to that point, we gotta work through some things before we can get there. So. In, uh, verse 20, uh, in chapter 23, verse 1, uh, really what you're going to see all the way through, honestly, all the way through verse 8, is that you're going to see um, uh, a, a, the lack of justice or the justice start taking place. So don't spread false reports into people. You know, don't start following the wrong crowds. Don't start uh, showing favoritism to, to people, as it says in verse 3. And then if you come across your enemy's uh, uh, donkey or stray ox, don't keep it, return it. If you see the donkey of somebody who hates you lying helplessly under its load, you, you might want to actually help them. And so these ordinances are really, they're probably harder uh, to live by than it's just to read. I mean, can you imagine living in the wilderness and the guy that's been the jerk to you this whole time, his donkey is just stuck under the wagon and you're like, <laughs> and then you're like, oh, dang it, that stupid ordinance. I need to go help him. Like these help us for a reason. They help us to overcome sin. By the way, in verse 8, don't take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and corrupts the words of the righteous. I mean, you go to certain countries and you get pulled over by a cop. It's it's an automatic. You just pay the cop. And the cop just, oh yeah, hey, great, no ticket. I mean, there's, there's worlds of corruption that are out there that are living by bribes. And the Lord says, by the way, I don't want that to happen in my land. Verse 9 continues on, you must not oppress a foreign resident. Uh, you yourselves know how it feels to be a foreigner because at one point you were a foreigner in the land of Egypt. So just be careful how you're treating the foreigners. And then, so that's that, that justice mentality, okay? Then it continues on in 10 through 17, which I love this part. Exodus 10 through 17 talks about the feasts. All right, now I want to tell you something. There's a lot here. So we're going to slow down, unpack it, and hopefully you'll see the bigger picture when we're all said and done. So in verse 10, Scripture says, sow your land for six years and gather its produce. In verse 11, but during the seventh year, you are to let the land rest and leave it uncultivated. Why? So that the poor among your people may eat from it and the wild animals may consume what they leave. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Kevin, you grew up in a a farming community mentality. Can you see this ever happening in America today? It's kind of done in different places in different ways still today. I mean, it's called laying fallow, but not once every seven years. Well, the fallow ground mentality, but how about even the mentality of you let it lay fallow, but then can you imagine just people walking out onto the land? It'd be a little weird. It, it would be weird, but scripturally here, this is how they did this. Rich, I, I just, I feel like I'm supposed to get your perspective on this. Well, I mean, it's just, it's a time of rest. I mean, if you look at it, God created everything. And then on the seventh day he rested. He's just saying, um, you can't just keep working and working and working and working. Everything actually needs rest, even the land. And so even when you're resting, how cool is it though, that God uses that rest to bless other people? I love that. It's an interesting perspective too, because they're in the wilderness. They haven't gotten to their land where this would actually take place yet. Great point. 
Verse 13. Okay, uh, did I skip verse 12? <laughs> yeah, do your work for six days, uh, but rest on the seventh day so that your ox and your donkey may rest. So now it's also giving rest to your animals. And the son of your female slave, as well as a foreign resident, may be refreshed. It just gives you a time to breathe for everybody. Okay, continues on in verse 13. But pay strict attention to everything I've said to you. You must not invoke the names of other gods. I love this. Don't you feel like randomly throughout all these ordinances, he's like, and by the way, don't, don't worship other gods. Don't make other idols. Just, they must not be heard on your lips. It's constantly this warning against idolatry. So here's what I want you to do, he says. I want you to celebrate a festival in my honor three times a year. Only God can say this. So God's going to say, throw me a party. How cool is that? And he's got to tell his people to throw him a party. Okay, first of all, he says, observe the festival of unleavened bread. Okay, we're going to do three of these. Remember, Kevin, go back to verse 14. He says, celebrate a festival in my honor three times. So the very first festival is the festival of unleavened bread. Observe the festival of unleavened bread. I'm going to read through it and then I'll explain it. As I commanded you, you are to eat unleavened bread, okay, for seven days at the appointed time in the month of Abib. Prince Abi Bali Abi Babwa. Because you came out of Egypt in that month. No one is to appear before me empty handed. Look, we're talking about ordinances. Somebody needs to start singing, okay? <laughs> uh, another name for this, TJ, I know you know this. Do you remember the other name for this one? Think about this one. This is starts with a P, ends with an R. Awesome. Passover. Okay, Passover is the beginning of the festival of unleavened bread, okay? Now, this time frame that we're supposed to celebrate this in the month of Abib, I know you guys want to start singing that now. Prince Abib, Ali Abib. Okay, we know that it's going to be roughly in March or April, okay? And really, you guys, <laughs> man, it, it's pretty cool if you, if you think about all that's, that's taking place. All 12 tribes are supposed to do this. Okay, the lamb is slaughtered, and they're, they're saying for eight days we are going to rejoice that what, what took place? Exodus. The exodus started. I mean, is that right? What did you say? The exodus started. Did I get that right, Tom? The exodus started. And so, you guys, I don't want you to ever forget. That's what he's saying. I want you to celebrate three times a year. One of them is, I've set you free. In order to engage uh, an Israelite, in order to engage a Jewish person, you need to know their culture better than them. Why? Because I want to make them jealous of what I know about their God. Guess what? He's my God too. And I want to know it inside and out. And you need to understand the festivals because they celebrate them. Why? Because of their deliverance, you and I have a Messiah. Does that make sense? Because of the Passover and the Lamb, you and I have a Messiah. God spared the Israelites because of what God did through, through the Lamb. We need to understand our own history, our own heritage. We need to understand it. Christians, those that follow Yeshua, you need to understand your heritage is rooted, yes, in the festival of unleavened bread. And for some weird reason, honestly, we just don't take time understanding why, we why we're supposed to celebrate something. So I want us to remember these festivals and maybe, maybe even celebrate them. Wouldn't that be cool? Okay, number two. Uh, let's go, uh, Kevin, if you can, verse 16. Also observe the festival of harvest with the first fruits of your produce from what you sow in the field. All right. Second one. Festival of Harvest. It's 50 days after Passover. So March, April, May, May, June. Would that be right? 50 days, yeah. Hello? Anybody on my math for me? Yes. May yep. and June? Yeah. Yep. Ish. Okay. Tom, do you remember any of the other names of the Festival of Harvest? Uh, Feast of Weeks. Yeah. Look at that. And there's one more. Pentecost. Pentecost. Because remember, this is celebrated 50 days after Passover. Obviously, what stands out with Pentecost? Anybody want to take a stab? Holy Spirit. Yeah, in Acts 2, 
uh, maybe verse 11, Kevin, Acts 2, verse 11, th this is the same day. Pentecost took place on the 50th day, Pentecost Day. Uh, just says, that's what I was looking for, when the day of Pentecost had arrived. So Acts 2, 1, thanks, had arrived, they were all together in one place. So here you are in the festival of harvest, already taking place 50 days later on Pentecost. This is when the Holy Spirit shows up to the church. So now we're, we're blending the festival of the harvest of Pentecost together, which, which is totally our, our language. Um, okay, number three. Uh, we're going to go to, it's a weird name for me. I think it's weird, but go back to Exodus 23, 16. Okay, aside from the festival of harvest, which you're presenting the first fruits, I want you to observe the festival of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather your produce from the field. So your third and final one that the Lord wants you to celebrate, festival of in gathering, okay. Uh, it's also known as Tom. You remember this? I don't remember. Booths or tabernacles. After forty years, forty years of wandering in the wilderness, okay, then they're celebrating how God gave them a new place. He gave them. They 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 went into their own booths. And so here they are, they're celebrating God bringing them out of the wilderness and then they lived in temporary booths. So what happens today in Israel, you know this, right? Is that you can go there today and they will set up on their balcony in their apartments, little miniature booths. Like they still have it. In fact, if you go outside in Jerusalem, anywhere in Israel, you will see people put them out on their sidewalks, out in front of their front yards. They have these makeshift tabernacles and what they're celebrating is that God delivered them from 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, it's a pretty cool picture. So you have the Festival of Unleavened Bread where you celebrate F uh, Passover and Exodus, okay, and the Deliverer. You're celebrating the Festival of Harvest, okay, and then for 50 days, seven weeks, you're bringing forth the first fruits of produce and all that the Lord has been doing in your life. And then in number three, the Festival of Ingathering, also known as the Booths and Tabernacles, where you're celebrating the 40 years of wilderness and how God brought you out of it. Rich, Kevin, Jeff, Tom, you guys want to add anything to any of this? It's a lot, and it's not normal for a Christian to talk about the Jewish festivals. It's three distinct reasons to have a party. <laughs> well, that's good, Kevin. It is. And, you know, my mom always says, put your party pants on. <laughs> I was wondering when that was coming. Uh -huh. yeah, he set me up. Thanks. All right, so there you go. So verse 17, three times a year, all your males are to appear before the Lord God. Now, just so you know, women and children are invited. But many times in Scripture, uh, the males are, they're just counted. It's just kind of how it's been. But it doesn't mean that women and children are not. And then in verse 18, you must not offer the blood of my sacrifices with anything leavened. The fat of my festival offering, the best part of my offering, must not remain until morning. Verse 19, bring the best of the first fruits of your land to the house of the Lord your God. And then this is where it gets kind of weird. You must not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. You're like, why do I always have to go there, Lord? Let's just stick to the festivals. <laughs> All right, so can I dig into this just a little bit? You might as well, right? <laughs> All right, oh, Lord. Okay, young goats, okay, they're... Um, Favorite food of the people, and cooking it in milk, it would in, improve the taste. But to use mother's milk to cook her own offspring would reveal an attitude of the heart, which really is about sin. And really, this is about a Canaanite way, uh, a Canaanite pagan ceremony. So just be careful that you don't cook a, a mother's young goat in her own milk. That's like, that's just weird. I don't know how else to describe it. A mom, all of a sudden, I, th I think you get it. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and here's another weird one for you. And oh, by the way, Weersby says this. Milk, uh, this milk was actually sprinkled on trees and fields to help uh, promote fertility. And it was a magical practice. So like this was some of the weird things that people did. So you feel like, oh, by the way, don't mess with the young goats, milk and the mom. Like, you, God has to just explain these things because of weird things that people do. We're going to go to verse 20. So all of this is taking place, and now God just continues to build the case. He says, I'm going to send an angel before you to protect you on the way and bring you to the place I have prepared. What verse does this make you think of? Please, somebody. 
It's back when Jacob encounters the angels when he's coming back to Esau. That's a good one. How about even, even just recently? Do you remember this? Do you remember when the Israelites, you're right, Kevin, that's a great one, but do you remember how all of a sudden the angel who was going before them, he was at the Red Sea, and the next thing you know, all of a sudden he says, now I'm going to be behind you. It's the same thing. I'm going to be before you to protect you on the way, and now I'm going to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Over and over and over, this angel goes before. I'm telling you guys, this is probably one of the coolest parts of all of the Old Testament. What I want to do is this. I'm, I want to come back to, uh, no, let's do it right now. Let's do it right now. This angel, I'm going to give you 11 scenarios of how the angel has shown up in the Old Testament in which every time I believe could possibly be Christ. Okay, number one, we talked about this. And Kevin, don't worry about going there. Uh, number one is that the angel wrestled with Jacob in Genesis 32. Do you remember when Jacob was redeemed? Kevin, can you go to Genesis 48, verse 16, though, for this one? Uh, remember when Jacob was redeemed from all of evil? Genesis 48, verse 16. The angel who has redeemed me from all harm, may he bless these boys, and may, he, they, may they be called by my name. So the angel, Jesus, has redeemed him from all harm. So we have Jacob interacting, Jacob interacting. And then how about Moses in the burning bush in, in Exodus 3? And then you have in verse uh, number four, uh, he protected Israel at the Red Sea in Exodus 14, 19. So we just, we just alluded to that, Exodus 14, 19. Again, the angel of the Lord is showing. He's going before, but now he's going to protect them. He moved and he went behind them. Interesting enough, he prepared Israel for the promised land in Exodus 23, verse 20. Exodus 23, verse 20. Again, the same language. I'm going to send an angel before you to protect you on the way. Continues on. It really gets even more fun here. Go to Joshua 5, verse 13. This angel reassured, okay, as MacArthur said, Joshua. Look at this. He says, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua approached him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? And continues on in verse 14. Neither. I, am now, I have now come as the commander of the Lord's army. And then Joshua bowed with his face to the ground and worshiped and asked, what does my Lord want to say to his servant? In verse 15, the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy. When you look at it with this lens, all of a sudden the burning bush makes sense. How many times, you guys, when we talk about angels, the angels say, no, get up, get up, get up. Not this time. I really believe that the Deliverer is all throughout the Old Testament. Continually shows up, even in Gideon. Poor little Gideon. Judges 6, verse 11. Judges 6, verse 11. Here you have Gideon. The angel of the Lord came and he sat, he sat down. <laughs> Under the oak that was in, I always say Oprah, but it's not. Uh, Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abizrite. His son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine vat in order to hide it from the Midianites. And then in verse 12, look what the angel does. Then the angel of the Lord approached, appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Over and over, this angel of the Lord is going ahead, sending protection. He's providing. He's clearing the way. And you know what the crazy thing is? He's clearing the way for himself. He's doing the work. Judges 13, I think, verse 3. We're going to try something here. I can't read my writing. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, It is true that you're unable to conceive and have no children, but you will conceive and give birth to a son. Keep going. Scripture continues, Now please, now please be careful not to drink wine or beer or just eat anything unclean. Keep going. And then the angel of the Lord just has this conversation with, it's pretty cool, you guys, with Samson's mom. Keep going here, Kevin, if you would. I want to go to 1 Kings uh, 19, verse 7. The angel of the Lord uh, shows up to Elijah. And the angel of the Lord returned a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat or the journey will be too much for you. Whenever there, it seems like there's a calling on somebody in the Old Testament, it just seems like the angel of the Lord shows up. Go to two more. Go to Isaiah 37. Go to Isaiah 37, I think, Kevin, verse 36. Isaiah 37, verse 36. If not, it's verse 
Yeah, then the angel of the Lord, we talked about this, <clears throat> and how, remember how we use this comparison about how the destroyer, remember during the Passover, how we used this verse as it, the reason that maybe it could be Jesus destroying and going and killing the firstborns, is that the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. So when the people got up the next morning, there were all these dead bodies. So the angel of the Lord, yeah, uh, we'd like to think it has, you know, nice wings and a halo, but I think the angel of the Lord has a really crazy, ridiculous purpose, and that's to constantly prepare the way for, for his return. In that context, it would have been for his first return, and now it's for, the, for, his, come, for his second return. And then one more, Kevin. I want you to go to Daniel 3, verse 29. Daniel 3, 25. Uh, Tom, make note. I need to get better pens and stay awake when I'm doing this. <laughs> he exclaimed, look, I see four men not tied walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. You can say, well, that's a stretch. No, I, I believe if, if God's been working with all of these other great men of God, why wouldn't this not be uh, the angel of the Lord as well? And so here's why I unloaded all of those scenarios. Okay, I love how MacArthur spells all that out for us. Because I want you to see that God has been so present with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he's going to continue to do the same thing with Moses and his people. And so what we saw in verse 20 is how he's going to go ahead. But now listen in verse 21. He says, but be attentive to him and listen to his voice. <laughs> Isn't that cool? I want you to listen to this voice. Do not defy him because he will not forgive your acts of a rebellion for his name is in him. Somebody just say amen. Like amen. you have Jesus showing up to the Israelites. Jesus showing up to Moses. How do I know? Jude 1, 5. Jude 5 is so clear that the Lord is the one who's doing the work. The Lord is the one who is delivering his people. Now, I want to remind you that you know all these things. The Lord first saved the people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who did not believe. The Lord is with the Israelites. And in verse 22 of Exodus, Kevin, if you'll go back to Exodus 23, but if you'll carefully uh, obey him and do everything I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. For my angel will go before you and bring you to the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and I will wipe them out. You must not bow down to their gods or worship them. Do not imitate their practices. Instead, demolish them, smash their sacred pillars to pieces. Worship the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water. I will remove illnesses from you. I love that one. No woman will miscarry or be childless in your land. I will give you the full number of your days. He's saying, if you would just walk this conditional covenant out, I'll cause the people ahead of you to feel terror and throw into confusion all the nations you come to. I'll make all your enemies turn their backs to you in retreat. And then I'll send the hornet in front of you. <laughs> oh man, just because of the sake of time, I'm not going to unpack this one. And it will drive the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites away from you. The only thing I'll tell you is this. Is this hornet a legit, like, one hornet? <laughs> <laughs> it's a seriously large hornet, man. That's all I got to say. At the same time, though, in uh, Isaiah 7, uh, Egypt is known as a fly and Assyria is known as a bee. I don't know. All I know, though, is, is it, it, it could be a hornet. It could be. In fact, can you go to Deuteronomy 7, verse 20? Deuteronomy 7, verse 20. The Lord your God will also send the hornet against them until all the survivors and those hiding from you perish. I don't know. I just don't want to encounter this hornet. <laughs> That's all I know. Literal or, or uh, figurative. I'm sure this will create a discussion, but verse 29, I just, I, just so you know, God is the one that's going ahead. That, that's what we need to know. God is the one that's going ahead. In verse 29, I won't drive them out ahead of you in a single year. I'd be like, come on, God, why not? No, nah, I'm not going to do it in a single year. Otherwise, watch this. The land would become desolate and wild animals would multiply against you. The timing is not right. God's timing is so good, but yet we want everything right now, don't we? And I love this. This verse just struck me to the core. Verse 30, I will drive them out little by little. Ahead of you until you become numerous and take possession of the land. In other words, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start taking it away a little at a time because I know you can't handle it all at once. 
If I was to give you possession of the land right now, you would be overtaken by wild animals and it wouldn't work. But little by little, I'm going to take away your enemies. And I got to be honest, in life, who wants little by little? Nobody wants little by little. Everybody wants the land now. But I think this is a great example of just let it happen in God's timing, even if it's slow. Everybody wants a microwave, but nobody wants a crock pot. It's just that mentality of let it cook slowly. Little by little, the Israelites became numerous. Little by little, you got to let the, the Lord work in, in such a way through individual souls. And Meyer says, little by little, you got to let the conquest of the cross win over the world. Little by little, he says, you got to let the purpose of redemption manifest itself throughout the earth. Little by little, God has a plan. We want it all now, but God has it differently. Verse 31, 32, and 33, he sets the borders for what the land looks like. He says, I'll set your borders, Israelites, from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. I mean, it's a pretty cool picture. From the Red Sea <laughs> to the Mediterranean Sea. Okay? And then he says, from the wilderness, <laughs> where's the Euphrates? It'd be the, to the north and to the east, far east. Oh, yeah, thanks. What Rich said. All right, so the point is this map is incomplete, okay? <laughs> From the wilderness to the Euphrates. For I will place the inhabitants of the land under your control, and you will drive them out ahead of you. Verse 32, you must not make a covenant with them, right? You can't align yourself with the foreigners or their gods. And then it closes out in verse 33. They must not remain in your land or else they will make you sin against me. If you worship their gods, there's something that God just keeps saying, please put your focus on me and not on their false gods. If you worship their gods, it will be a trap. It will be a snare for you. Over and over and over again, God says, I'm with you. Just trust me in the timing. And in the timing, I'm going to send the angel of the Lord with you. You have nothing to worry, but please remember to have a party and celebrate. You got three festivals, the festivals of the unleavened bread, the festival of the harvest, the festival of the ingathering. And then as a result of all of those things, God says, I'll go with you one day at a time. Crazy thing is, is that leads to Exodus 24. <laughs> Exodus 24, then Moses comes and he tells the elders all of the ordinances. The people say, we're going to do it. They set up an altar and the 12 pillars. And then these young men that we talked about, they perform these offerings, the priests, the, the new priests that we don't quite know yet, but they're offering these things. Then they read the covenant. They sprinkle the blood on the people, this blood of the covenant. Then they saw the God of Israel. They come up to the mountain. Lot starts taking place. Moses and jo Joshua, uh, they go up. Moses wants up. Then the glory of the Lord is present. The seventh day, God calls Moses. And then Moses in verse 18 of 24, Moses enters the cloud and he stays on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. That's where we get to leave the story today. <laughs> we just read through a chapter in less than maybe 30 seconds. That's kind of the beauty of all this. My prayer is that as you go through this in the readings of Genesis or Exodus 23 and through 24, the Lord will speak to you what you need to, uh, what you need to hear. It might have nothing to do with Exodus 23. It might have everything to do with Exodus 24. Whatever the case is, keep pressing in. Even in the ordinances, God wants to speak to you. I am greatly encouraged by how God says, celebrate all that I've done in your life. And as you do, remember, I'm with you little by little. All right, bless you all. We'll talk to you tomorrow.